my daddy was a doctor. He was a, uh, an ophthalmologist, which is an otorhinolaryngologist, eye, ear, nose, and throat. Now they just say ear, nose, and throat because the eye specialists have their own, you know, their own practice. But it used to be combined. Well, anyway, um, he was just he was just so wonderful. He was always so jolly. He was always whistling, and he was just a happy, such a happy man. He never met a stranger, and he just was always helping others who were, you know, if they couldn't afford treatment, he'd treat them free. How about your mother? My mother was just she was wonderful too. She was as she they call it today a housewife but uh, she was the most talented person I guess that's where I got my art interest but she was uh, she was fabulous at, at flower arranging and I have she always had something on the tables if it wasn't a flower it was a wax leaf ligustrum bush from the from the from the garden mm -hmm. and uh, and she was a wonderful cook she was always well, she was entertaining she was she was in charge of the women's club luncheons and all these things that she belonged to what was her maiden name perry it was annabelle perry and daddy was james sydney perry and he was from the johnson perry's from tulsa oklahoma and missouri <laughs> it goes way back but um Let's see, what else? Well, uh, what was it like growing up in that town back then? Well, looking back, it was really fun. But of course, when you, live, when you live in a little tiny town, and it was a little tiny town, we thought it was boring. <laughs> you know, we needed excitement. But <laughs> I wish we had that kind of excitement now, because it's just, it's just it, was, it was a wonderful little town. Did you have air conditioning? Oh no, heavens no. Well, we did have some of the unit. Well, we did have like a an attic fan that would pull the air in from the outside. One of those big things that made a lot of noise. But um, and let's see, we had. Well, we had. I remember mother would put some rotating fans. You know, the ones that went back and forth mm -hmm. around. She'd put them in the fireplace, and then she'd put a fern plant, a huge fern plant, in the front of the fans and that would make them flow. Oh. And it made you feel like you were cool. <laughs> it really worked. And, um, psychologically cool. Yeah, psychologically. But, um, so no, we had no air conditioning. But really, that kept the house pretty cool. As cool as could be. Were you only child? No, I had a brother. Okay, let's see. And uh, he was James Sidney Perry Jr. And he was he was just the sweetest thing. He 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 died two years ago, but um, he I remember from the f time he was he could have a news he had a news um, what do you call him the paper route? Yes, news uh, yes, paper. Yes, and he tithed everything that he ever made, ten percent of everything, and. Uh, he was just a he was a wonderful he was a wonderful Christian. He was just a fabulous person until he got into the Marine Corps. And then that just sort of changed his I don't know, it just really screwed him up. He said that he was the only white boy in the big in, in a big black platoon and they really had it in for him, especially when they found out his daddy was a doctor. I mean it was terrible. It just his mind just so, but years later, so for about 35 years, we had no contact. We didn't know where he was. But finally, he ended up in a, a, the veterans hospital over in Temple, and we found him because he'd had a stroke. And um, so we found him, and we brought him over to, to this new one over in, in Temple. And uh, so anyway, and then he he was fine. He seemed I don't know what happened to him. He just sort of his mind cleared up, and he was just wonderful. So we had a good relationship for like the back the last two years of his life. Well, the moral of that story is, don't count somebody out. I guess. Oh, that's right, and just have faith in them and how to help them. And but he um, he 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 was always religious. But they said that over here at the at the hospital, his roommate happened to be um, a scientist with uh, NASA who was very knowledgeable about the, about the Bible 
and they talked about it every day and he read it read the Bible every day well anyway they said the, the, and he was just everybody loved him the nurses just loved him if he went out for a um, for anything with with us or the you know my daughters would go over and see him quite often and and he would always always want to go buy Godiva a candy place and he'd just buy dozens of pieces of Godiva chocolate he'd take them all back to the nurses and then and for the cookies too he'd buy dozens and dozens and with what in the world but he'd always give them to the people that worked there well I mean, he was just one of their favorites and they said the last day of his life he was just so happy and he he was talking to everybody and 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 he sat down for dinner he took one bite leaned his head back and died I mean to me that is just and I just <laughs> I start getting emotional about it but anyway I wish we'd had more time with him but we had those two wonderful years be so th be thankful always for the time oh that yes you have. oh yes mm -hmm. and this is what I keep t I try to tell my children uh, I wish I could see my grandchildren more and and now let them read this or listen to it just just think about what you say to your parents and your grandparents and if you love them be sure and tell them so and the things that you know because sometimes they might not be around here I mean I'm 85 I'll be 86 next week so and congratulations <laughs> thank you and their their grandfather their other grandfather is in his I think I don't know maybe he's 90 now but you just have got to treasure the moments you have with them and don't have any regrets because you will have regrets I mean I have regrets even though I've lived well I've lived a very hectic but very very interesting um, life Good. but I still have regrets about things I didn't say or I didn't do and you should not you just don't want to go to your grave with too many regrets mm -hmm. whether they're good or bad well let's talk about you I'm going to reposition my camera here for a moment and just a little bit and and I'll ask you to look at me if you can when oh okay uh, and um, let's talk about you so you uh, grew up in uh, in uh, uh, grew up in Bryant yep mm -hmm. and then what happened well Let's see. <laughs> and and, and I, I, maybe I should ask you, um, well, who is the person who's most influenced on your life? Who um, my you whole life? Yeah, one person or, or several people. Well, I think the majority of my life was was uh, in art. And, um, oh, there was Miss Sophronia Carrington, my art teacher in, my, in, in junior high, and she was absolutely wonderful. And she was probably the most influential, I, I would say you got me started, not sure. most influ influential. And then um, later, let's see, um, I, w I was majoring in, I was going to major in um, art in my sophomore, no, my, yeah, my sophomore year I went to the University of Oklahoma. And it was, <laughs> I have a hard time keeping my eyes straight. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, now let's see what was that? that was University of Oklahoma oh yeah University of Oklahoma okay and that's where I was uh, I started in art well it was a joke they weren't teaching that was in 1950 but they really weren't teaching and they would say all right in fact one one subject was in sculpture and said, okay well go is that go what they said? oh you know <laughs> and, or in in painting well, I didn't know. I didn't at that time. I hadn't really studied in it. It was much later in life. But uh, paint what, or how, what, what colors mixed to to make what? You know, it was just awful. And I mean, what medium are you going to use? So you have a watercolor or that's you, what right. You, and it was what it, brushes for that? So anyway, it was it was a, it was the worst art experience I've had in my life. So I switched. Okay, the next and then the next year, I. Um, I think the next year I got married. <laughs> the first year I went to Baylor, next year I went to Oklahoma, where I had I just thought I had to be in a sorority. Okay. So it was great. It was a great experience. I lived. I pledged Kappa Kappa Gamma, and I lived in the sorority house. And it was really fun. What did you major in? 
Uh, that was when I majored in art. Okay. Then and you got was, into an art program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then uh, when I got married then, that was, I married a, a, a pilot, a jet pilot from Bryan Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And he was a wonderful young man. He was my first husband. And he was just, but he, unfortunately, after we had two children, we married and had two children. And then he had a, he, well, he had a flame out and the parachute didn't open. Mm. He ejected and he was killed. And that experience was, I could tell you about that later. I bet you had lots of military family, uh, so to speak, that were, that you could turn to when that happened? Did no. You? No, you didn't? No. It was Brian Air Force Base. Daddy was a doctor and everything, you know. But um, no, I had, I had no military Support connections, system. no. Mm -hmm. We went over to Germany our first year we were married and then came back we, we were married eight years almost eight years when he was killed and the girls were two and a half and five and uh, how did you manage well at that <laughs> yeah at that in those days the military didn't pay you know hard anything and then what one thing i really resented about the about the military it was on armed forces day weekend that he was killed but they didn't consider him on active duty because he hadn't been on he'd been flying for 72 hours so i didn't get any of the benefits for the girls even i mean i could have really used it when they had braces and you know just take them to the doctor i couldn't mm. because and i think we i don't know what it was um anyway let's see yeah you said something about the, your first husband you had more than one oh <laughs> <laughs> I'm only saying that because you set me up with that. <laughs> I probably shouldn't get into this. Yeah, I, I was married. I, I've been married five times, and I didn't kill any of them. I didn't. And anyway, maybe a couple of them I could have. But anyway, the first one was a pilot. Okay, the jet pilot. We were married almost eight years. The second one was a, just a friend. And because um, he just loved the girls, I moved down to Kingsville so I could, so I could go from Buffalo, New York, so I could um, go back to college. And my aunt and uncle lived down there, and they helped with the, with the children. They, they were like their grandchildren. And um, so I you went from snow to oh, desert-like conditions. Yes, I know it. And our our helper, the help, woman that helped me, had a car, and um, I had her for twenty-five dollars a week. She'd take the girls to school or the kindergarten and everything, and, and oh, it was just wonderful. It was a wonderful experience because she had good help. And then, uh, and her husband, my maid's husband, was a, a uh, he, worked, he was at the King Ranch, one of the groomers at the King Ranch. So it was a small town, and everybody knew each other, and you know, it was great. Okay, so um, let's see. All right, that was uh, okay. Then that was the second one. Yes, and. Uh, he was he was a friend, but he died. He finally died of AIDS because he was he was gay. I didn't know it. I did not know it. And uh, the third one, <laughs> this is a, this is a funny one. He's he was. I was trying to remember a while ago what I used to call him. He was my manic depressive alcoholic brain tumor, and he was uh, he was sociopath. And uh, anyway, I married him. And must he, have had your hands full. Well, yeah, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know he was an alcoholic or anything until after I married him. And then they said he was so good looking. At this, you might want to blank this out. They said he was so good looking he could have talked the pants off a nun. <laughs> well, <laughs> he was very good looking. He was very good looking, but um, let's see. Okay, well, he finally he finally died of cancer. He had a brain tumor. I mean, he was, uh, had cancer all over him and and alcoholism and it, it was really sad because he really was a great guy but he was this sociopathic stuff I didn't I didn't understand it he talked to all of our friends into investing in his wonderful schemes and and they would and then lose money and then you know it's almost my fault I guess they thought so anyway okay so then he died and then the next one was I could, <laughs> we, I, I, <laughs> God I see he was a he was a colonel who thought he was a general. Retired colonel, lieutenant colonel, in fact, not even a whole one. But he was just, I don't know, it was a bad mistake. 
but we were married two years and he died of a heart attack so then the last one was it about about three years later about three years between each one so it wasn't like I went to one to the other but that that was the longest and he and he was wonderful we had a really good marriage we were, we were together 25 years That's wonderful. and uh, he was from San Antonio he grew up in the Presbyterian Church in San Antonio for all, all his life and you know knew lots of people and so we we had a, a good marriage and he was real close he was close to the girls and um, and they they loved him and but he had one and he had one daughter well they had two two sons and they live in Houston but he had one daughter who was uh, just, she was just precious Paula Lloyd and she had joined the army she was just brilliant and she was over in Afghanistan. She'd already been at Georgetown University had called her back and the Smithsonian did call her back for an interview. I mean, she really was, she, speak, she spoke Farsi or something. And uh, so she was a interviewing this man in Afghanistan and he just pulled the rag off his pitcher and threw gasoline all over and set her fire. Yeah. It, was, it was a horrible, horrible thing. And then she, she was in the burn center at uh, was it Brooke? It's Sam Houston. Okay. Yeah. At, uh, anyway, she was there for two months before she died. Just oh. excruciating, horrible. Mm. But they said it was a good thing because she it burned off her two ears. They tried to replace those twice. It didn't work. Her nose, to you know, and, and her digits on her fingers. And she knew that she wouldn't be able to type her reports and, what anymore. Is, what a sacrifice. Oh, it was horrible. And the, her magnificent girl. Let's talk about your art. Uh, oh, okay. Your art oh, yeah. interest. Well, we got you into an art program okay. at the at university. All right. Well, <laughs> we were there, but then that's I switched. You know, I, I got out of that. Okay, it wasn't until later, after the girls were born, and I was visiting my aunt and uncle in Tulsa, and I heard of Priscilla Hauser. And Priscilla was the, the lady that that started the um, let's see what was how what was it called it was the uh, well anyway it was it was the art program the, excuse me um, art I can't think of the name of it now but it was anyway that's all right the art program where was it well it was national international okay and uh, it was the um, total and decorative painters and it was an organization that grew nationwide and then internationally and everything so I started taking lessons art lessons and there would be seminars like a week-long seminar here and there on roses or oh. pears and apples and grapes you know things like that okay that's how I really got into the painting that I have done for the past what 40 some odd years and I started I really got into it is took from every good master painter that I could take from and they'd have week-long seminars some of them two weeks and I was right there in the seminar and so then I started teaching but then from the from apples and pears I went to um, murals and I called them Trump Loy and that's hard for people it's Trump Loy what's that well a Trump Loy is fool the eye or you know you paint something exactly like it is same size everything all right, so I, I was in, into that, and then I started painting, painting um, as I say, murals, scenes on, I did mar scenes on ceilings, marbleizing floors, and I mean, it, you know, it, and I went over to, I went over to um, Scotland and painted a scene on a ceiling in a castle, in a dining room, and um, oh, I went over and I took from Ian Kearney, who was the leading uh, Trump lawyer artist at that time artist teacher took from him several times I mean it was just I couldn't get enough of it I was just obsessed and so then I would come back and I would you know I'd teach in my garage I had a two-story three three I mean not two story three car garage it turned into a studio it was wonderful but I'd only have like six or eight students at the time because I didn't want a big group and that's what I did the last 25 years of my life until I, <laughs> I couldn't, oh, I said, oh, I, the first, the scariest thing that I've ever done was this two-story big mural that I had to paint in this home that was being built over in Alamo Heights in San Antonio. 
had to climb a two-story scaffolding and paint by myself. I was carrying paint buckets up a, a scaffolding. <laughs> and I tell you, you're lucky, was, you're lucky you're here. I know it well. In one, <laughs> it, one, one morning I was climbing up, and I had and I grabbed hold of the rod that went over here, and the thing came loose. And I just well, and I said, and, and I grabbed hold of something else, so I, I didn't fall. But we had to laugh because the the family that I was painting for, he he had happened to be a brain surgeon. Or you know there was a, so he could have fixed my brain if I'd fallen on the marble floor. But you know it's just I had lots of experiences. That sounds like you had lots of clients that were interesting people too. I well, would. it was word of mouth. I never never advertised. So you know it was it was fun. I had yeah. an interesting interesting career for me. Now, if you had your grandchildren or your grandchildren's grandchildren um, listening and watching this, uh, what would you want them to know that you've uh, learned over the years about people or about business or about art? Um, well, I didn't learn much about business. I was a terrible businesswoman. But, um, you know, it just, I just wish they, they would appreciate the good art like and good furniture. Now, right now we're having a little problem because <laughs> my girls, my two daughters want me to get get rid of all this stuff you don't need it in the storage you know just get but some of it were like antiques that I wanted to save or, or beautiful silver well they don't nobody wants silver anymore they, they can't even the antique dealers can't even sell it someday it's going to come back and the people that sell that I had must have 16 sterling silver goblets like that beautiful it was fun to drink iced tea out of them or even wine out of them but I, I, I don't know. No, no, no. The women my age can understand it because their their oh. grandchildren and children are doing the same thing. Get rid of it. We want a polished silver. And the funny thing is, yesterday my maid came. She said, "I went over and I tried to find some silver polish at H E B. They don't even have it. They have oh, no. I think they had one one brand of silver polish. I mean." I, I just, it, it, it's beyond me. One generation's treasures, the next generation's uh, I know it. And something if people, else. If people were smart, they'd go to the antique dealers now, or the junk shops, or the Goodwills, or in the, and they gather up silver. I have found, my maid has found several pieces of Francis I sterling silver at Goodwill. I said, fine, just grab up as much as you can, and one of these days, it's going to come back, and they'll be sorry. There's wisdom. There's I know. Wisdom. So anyway, but no, another thing, just just be just be kind to people because if you're if you're not, whatever whatever you say is going to come back to you. You think that you're involved in the comment of the moment, but comment as time as time yes. goes by, you may find that you'll regret having said it. That's right. That's right. Well, this is uh, you know the. We've talked about the beginning and the middle uh, of your life, the creative part of your life, marriages in your life. Do you want to talk about, uh, sometimes I ask people what their parents died of or their grandparents died of because we don't have a lot of yeah. medical information about our uh, ancestors these yeah. days. Well, mine were uh, heart and cancer. So who had heart? Mother, my, my mother okay. and all of, all of her siblings. And then my daddy, all the people in his family, the men, and they were all <laughs> so funny. They had, well, Daddy had um, like five brothers, and they were all totally bald headed. They had to strip like this, ran bald headed up here. But there were two brothers that married two sisters. So his, his grandfather, or his father, mm -hmm. was bald headed, and his grand. The other, the uncle, had dark hair, lots of lots of hair, mm -hmm. and <laughs> hello. <laughs> anyway, the um, let's see, where was I? Okay, uh, they were bald headed. Yeah, it's too bald. Okay, but then the other brother had lots of hair, and all of his sons had lots of hair. You know, so it was just our, but they, they were two brothers that married two sisters. So you know, you wonder. Ball-headed, lots of hair. So, I don't know. 
Well, our genetic background is uh, becoming more and more important in mm -hmm. our, uh, medical histories and our children's and our children's children's medical histories. So oh, that's I know it. why I asked that question. I see. I wanted to ask you, but I, I really want to do a genealogy mm -hmm. search. So that would be fun if y'all I've done it in my family and I found it very rewarding. Yeah. Oh, I know. I just I would love it. But let's see. Um I think we're doing pretty well here. We've done Let me just take a look. We've done 26 minutes. And uh and I recommend about um that l length of time or shorter. Oh, there's one thing. The thing that meant most, I've never forgotten and I will never forget. The thing that meant the most in my life was when my when my husband was killed, and it was on a Sunday. And, and something like that, when you have a really traumatic thing to happen to you, I have found that you never you remember every detail and the blood rushing to your feet. It, exactly, that's what happened to me. But the um, Okay, it was a Sunday afternoon. We were we were getting ready to go to go to the Episcopal Church to practice a, a musical that we were all going to be in. My husband and, and I, and um, I remember exactly what I had on. Had on a white turtleneck sweater. It was in the it was it was cool in Buffalo, but it was May nineteenth, nineteen what <laughs> nineteen fifty six. No, sixty three. I'm sorry. How could I forget that? Okay, May 19, 1963. But anyway, um, all of a sudden I was vacuuming and my granddaughter, who was, or Catherine was five then, she looked up and she said, Mommy, there's a policeman at the door. They were ringing their doorbell and I looked up and there was, there was the minister, Episcopal minister, and there were three of Ed's Air Force, you know, friends. And uh, so I went to the door, and I had just heard it on the radio. They just said there'd been an airplane, air, air, a jet crash at Camp Drum, New York. <coughs> excuse me, New York. And um, you know, told all about the crash. And so I opened the door, and I said, "He's dead, isn't he?" Before they even said, "You know, there was a crash." I said, "There'd been a crash, but he's dead." And they said, well, how did you know? I said, I heard it on the radio. They didn't say his name, but I just knew. I was a little, sometimes I think I'm a little bit psychic, so I can, I remember, I can feel things, or I can, I can know something's going to happen. Well, anyway, so uh, they came in, and they told me about the, about the crash and everything, and he'd had a flame out, and the, the wing tipped in the plate first, it didn't open, but then, um, the, so the minister was Ed Kreider and was, was in Snyder, New York, right outside Buffalo. He said, do you want me to tell the children? I said, no. And I was crying. I said, no, I can't tell them. I can't tell them. Would you please tell them? So he took them into the bedroom, Catherine and Polly, two and a half and five. And he came out and he just had tears in his eyes. He said, I have never in my life talked to children with that much understanding of what has happened. And I said, well, what did they say? So he told what Catherine said to him. She said, well, I know three things. My daddy loved us very much. He's in heaven with God and Jesus, and at least the devil didn't get him. <laughs> is that wonderful? That is terrific. And I would, I've told that so many times, Catherine says, oh, mother. But it's just, it's just incredible. So that was my, that's my favorite story. It's a tragic story, but it's my favorite story. And it's a real story. And it's your story. That's right. And you lived it, and, and, and you moved on uh, from it. And yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but and, but it, you just have to. You have to move on. And I just feel like anything that happens to you, you are at the place where you're supposed to be in your well, the so-called journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't used to believe in all that but I do now and I mean I, you are so just don't worry about where you are you're supposed to be there and the things that happen are supposed to happen I mean even though you might not you know it's horrible things but it does it does happen but just believe in God and Jesus and at least the devil didn't get you hopefully <laughs>